Final speaker uh, for the first panel this morning. Uh, doesn't need much introduction, but I will anyway. Uh, this is going to be Jesse Baring. Uh, Jesse is the uh, director of the Center for Science Communication, uh, who's co hosting uh, this event. Uh, Jesse is a wonderful uh, exemplar of, of science communication. He's written a number of uh, books on uh, topics ranging from uh, religion and, and belief uh, through uh, perversion to uh, suicide. Uh, the striking thing, uh, Jesse's uh, read his most recent book on, on suicide, and this is obviously a very difficult uh, topic, uh, and I think Jesse in the book handles it very sensitively. Uh, and as is typical of his work, however, he also combines both um, a, a really remarkable degree of personal uh, storytelling and exposure of his own uh, feelings about these things, but also, and this is really surprising in a book on suicide, a quite wonderful sense of humour. There's a lot of laughs <laughs> in Jesse's book on suicide, which you'll struggle to believe, but uh, they are there. So Jesse, please come uh, for our final talk this morning. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I've got a relatively brief talk. Um, I'm going to be spending my time discussing um, the developmental sequelae underlying people's um, thinking about the presence of others in their environment, and specifically the presence of disembodied spirits. Um, how do we learn how to or sort of innately be receptive to uh, the presence, the perceived presence of ghosts, let's say, in our environment. Uh, when I was a kid, I was absolutely petrified of ghosts. Um, I wanted to be a paranormal psychologist, I think, for the first uh, 10 years of my life. I ravenously read every book that I could about um, ghost detection. Um, I remember there was one suggestion where if you hold up your dog's ears and you look between their ears, over their head, you, can be able, you should be able to spot a ghost, but that was not uh, terribly effective, it turned out. Um, and I don't know, you know why I was drawn to this particular topic um, or this, this particular issue, um, but I suspect that it uh, had something to do with the way that I was being raised, some of the, some of the traditions in which um, uh, I was being, uh, traditions that I was exposed to. I... Um, grew up in a mixed faith household. My mother was Jewish, my father was Lutheran, um, so we celebrated the high holidays in Judaism, Passover, Hanukkah, uh, but also Christmas, Easter. So I, uh, I had this um, sort of interesting childhood experience. But um, as the youngest child in my family, one of the traditions at the Passover Seder is that uh, you go to the front door and you let in the spirit of Elijah. Um, so you're having this, with your family, you're having this Passover Seder dinner, uh, this really sort of ritualistic dinner set, um, and your parent says, uh, there's a knock at the door, can you please go to the front door and let in the spirit of Elijah? And I, did, I would do this, and I was absolutely petrified to go to the front door, open the door, and presumably there's like a whoosh of air um, where Elijah comes into the household, and while you're standing at the door, he rushes through and drinks a glass of wine that's on the table in the dining room in the other, in the other room. And then you come back, of course, and the, the glass is empty, and your parents convince you that Elijah came in and, and drank that glass of wine, when in fact it was your father or your mother that had, that had, that had done that. Um, but... In my mind, when I was a little kid, I, I assumed that he never left, that he, he came in the, into the house and he was haunting the house still. Um, and I was very scared of Elijah. So things that, strange things that were happening in the house, I assumed that uh, this was Elijah's doing. So um, I think having experiences like that, uh, along with other types of interesting encounters with death, uh, inspired me personally to um, subject other children to these types of experiences in <laughs> controlled laboratory conditions. Uh, and I did a series of experiments um, years ago um, that I call today the, the Princess Alice Studies, 
where basically the, 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 the gist of it is that I told children that there is an invisible woman in the room with them. And I'm measuring their, um, their behavioral responses to this, um, this information, um, how they reason about things that happen in, in the room when she's presumably there with them. Um, and uh, one thing that, I, that I, I've never really shared uh, uh, is the fact that um, Alice, the name Alice, uh, is um, uh, eponymous, an epo eponymous sort of uh, memorial to my mother. My mother's name was Alice, and she died when I was in my early 20s. Um, and I thought this was sort of a nice way to honor her, the Princess Alice experiment. So most of these studies happened after she died. And one of the reasons is because well, as she was on her deathbed, we had lots of conversations about what it would be like to be dead. Um, we had these sort of frank, interesting, uh, intellectual conversations about uh, the nature of the afterlife. And I, even at that point, I was a skeptic and didn't believe that there were psychological experiences after death. But um, she struggled to sort of get her head around what it would be like to be dead. Um, and she used to tell me that, well, I'm going to come back to you, because I know that you're, I'm one of three children, and I was the, only, I was the resident atheist in the family. Um, she didn't feel like she needed to convince my brother or sister, but she told me that she would somehow come back and give me a sign that she had made it to the other side. Um, and that didn't happen, surprisingly. <laughs> However, the morning after she died, I did notice something, um, which was that the, the wind chimes right outside of her bedroom window were suddenly chiming um, early in the morning. And um, I... I registered the fact that, um, well, that, maybe that's her. Maybe that she, she's somehow telling me, in fact, that you know, it's very subtle, but um, she's telling me that she's okay. Uh, there was a part of me that wanted to believe that, um, and, and another part of me that, that well, it's just, you know, there's a, there's a slight wind, <laughs> um, so it's probably not that. But what was interesting was that I couldn't keep my mind from going there. Um, despite the fact that I rejected that attribution, my mind leapt to this um, uh, interpretation that she was trying to communicate with me somehow. So um, these series of experiences, I think, um, in my life led to some of the studies that I did uh, looking at uh, how children uh, reason about the presumed presence of a spirit in the room with them. Now, the first study that I'm going to tell you about, um, I did back in 2006 with uh, um, my colleague Becky Parker. And uh, it consisted of a game, a very sort of innocuous, fun game for uh, children between the ages of three and uh, nine. We had three distinct age groups here. We carved them up relatively arbitrarily. There was some theoretical framework here, but um, I'll spare that for now. We had the youngest children, who were three and four-year-olds, a a group of sort of uh, uh, children that were in the middle age range, five and six-year-olds, and then the oldest children in this particular study were seven to nine years old. And we brought them into the laboratory, and we said, um, uh, we'd like to play this game with you. I'm going to uh, ho hide this ball. She's held, held, holding up this ball, as you see in the first photo, or not photo, first illustration here, inside one of these two boxes. Um, and your job is to, um, once I say um, come back, and once I say pick the, ball, pick the box that you think the ball's inside of, to put your hand on top of that box. You can change your mind at any time um, by moving your hand to the opposite box. But when I say time's up, that's your final choice. And if you get it right, if you pick the right box, then we'll give you a prize, a sticker in this case. Now, there were two conditions in this study. There was a control group and experimental group. The control group just simply heard that these were the rules of the game. That was the protocol. Um, the experimenter had a ball, hit it inside one of these two boxes while the kid's standing in the corner of the room. The experimenter says, come back, uh, pick, your, pick your box, put your hand on top of the box that you think it's inside, wherever your hand is. When I say time's up, that's your final choice. The experimental group of children, however, were introduced to this invisible woman in the room. They were told, um, there's somebody very special here with us. Her name is Princess Alice. Um, she's a very friendly princess. We didn't want to make this a scary 
sort of demonic entity for these children or tell them that it's haunted or anything like that. So we showed them this drawing of a, a, a friendly princess on the wall, said that's the sort of, that's a picture of Princess Alice. And she's got a very um, special talent, uh, a magical ability where she can make herself invisible. And we, uh, most of the kids in this study knew what the word invisible meant, but if not, we explained to them um, what that concept referred to. She can make herself invisible. She's here, but you can't see her, and so on. Uh, and we said that Princess Alice really likes you, and she's going to help you play this game. So whenever you pick the wrong box, she's going to somehow let you know. She's going to give you a message. She's going to communicate with you somehow. So the, the idea here is that... Um, we wanted to find out the age at which children begin to see unexpected natural events as communicative messages, signs, omens. I wonder they interpret these sort of random happenings um, in the environment as um, uh, messages from the other side. Does it require some degree of cognitive sophistication to do that? And we made a couple of things happen. Either the picture of Princess Alice suddenly crashed to the ground as soon as they picked one of the two boxes. Um, and what would we expect them to do in that case? Well, if they saw it as a sign from Princess Alice, they should move their hand to the opposite box. Or we made a table lamp in front of them flash on and off. Uh, and those were the two um, anomalous events that we manipulated or uh, had control over. And what we found was that it wasn't until the age, the, the oldest, uh, it wasn't until the children were between the ages of seven and nine that they move their hand to the other box. So something is happening here cognitively that allows them to interpret um, these random events as Princess Alice some, giving them a message, um, telling them that they had chosen the wrong box. Uh, and our interpretation was that um, this basically requires the attribution of mental states to Princess Alice, um, that she knows that I don't know where the uh, where the ball is, is hidden, and that's what this is about. Now, the interesting thing is that although the oldest kids, uh, only the oldest kids move their hand to the other box in response to these events, we also asked them in the wake of the, in, in the, wake of the uh, study, uh, do you remember when the lights went on and off? Why do you think that happened? Do you, do you remember when the picture fell to the ground? Why do you think that happened? And the... The fascinating thing was that the youngest kids were actually the, the, the scientists, the best scientists in the group. The three- and four-year-olds would say things like, well, it was broken. Uh, it wasn't sticking very well to the wall. Um, um, something was wrong with it. They didn't connect it at all with Princess Alice, the three- and four-year-olds. The middle-aged middle -aged group said that, well, this was happening because Princess Alice did it. Um, but they didn't see it as her trying to communicate with them. It was more like she was a poltergeist in the room doing these weird things. Princess Alice did it because she wanted to. It wasn't about their behavior. It was just about her sort of running around, making the lights go on and off, or making the picture fall to the ground. They didn't connect it with um, their choice in the task. It was only the, the oldest kids that saw this as a message uh, that she did it because I, because I chose the wrong box. She was trying to tell, this was her way of telling me that I had chosen the wrong box. In fact, um, we saw, when we asked them this question, we saw um, all sorts of interesting responses. Like some of these kids would say that, things that we didn't even anticipate, that Princess Alice was making the, the clock tower, um, you know, um, and the other side of campus toll that was her talking to them, or the spider spinning its web in the corner of the room, that was Princess Alice making the spider do that. They basically saw Princess Alice as having her hands in everything, and these were all messages that, they were, uh, that she was trying to give them or communicate with them. It was almost like they were, well, I don't want to say schizophrenic, but uh, they were seeing meaning in things that were inherently meaningless, and it was only the oldest uh, children that did this. Um, Quickly, I'll tell you about another study I did with Princess Alice, um, where we wanted to find out if children think that they are in a room um, with an invisible woman, and they're tempted to cheat, are they less likely to do so, um, compared to children that are in a control condition where they hear nothing about an invisible woman in the room with them. So basically, we concocted this uh, fairly straightforward game, um, another game, where 
children were told that the, the um, it was one of these sort of Velcro uh, dartboard sort of uh, games where, um, which is easy enough, but we made it virtually impossible. Um, and the rules were, there were three rules. You had to stand behind that line in the room, um, so there was quite a distance between themselves and the dartboard. You had to stand with your back to the dartboard, and you had to throw with your non-dominant hand. Um, so we could literally um, calculate the number of times each child cheated um, when they thought that they were left alone in the room to play this game. And again, we told them that there was a prize um, for the child that had the highest score on this, on this particular game. Three conditions. One, just the control condition where they were told this was it, and they, after we gave them the instructions, we said, I'm sorry, I've got I've to leave the room right now. I've got to talk to your parents about something. Um, so you go ahead and play the game, and then we'll see what your score was at the end. And in fact, we had, a, we had a hidden camera in the room, and the parents were watching, and they were laughing while this was happening. So that was the control condition. The, uh, the, the, one of the experimental conditions was that there was an actual human experimenter sitting in that chair where that kid is sort of touching the chair right there as they were playing. And then the third um, condition was uh, Princess Alice. Again, we told them about Princess Alice. Princess Alice is in the room. She can make herself invisible. She's sitting in that chair right now. Um, and what we found was that uh, children that were in the invisible agent, the Princess Alice condition, uh, were just as likely to cheat, which was not likely at all, as those children who were told that there was an actual person sitting in that chair with them, compared to the kids that were uh, in the control condition where they thought that they were alone. Uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to end on a really brief video here to, this, this sort of paints a picture of what we saw happen. Um, but I think you can come to your own conclusions about the, the potency, this feeling that we are in the presence of an observing supernatural entity and how that actually um, influences our, our social behavior, especially in the domain of moral transgressions.
Okay, I'm going to end there. Thank you very much.